Okay, so welcome to this next video uh, in which we are discussing endophilins and the heart. Okay, right, so in this video what we want to do is continue the story. So, so far what we've seen is that uh, when the endophilin binds to its endophilin receptor, which is of either the A type or one of the B types, then that's going to activate the heterotrimeric GQ protein. Okay, so the alpha Q GTP complex is going to be formed, and that's going to activate the phospholipase C enzyme, which is of the beta type. Okay, and we want to understand what the phospholipase C beta is going to do. So we need to look at the molecule that it's going to break down. Okay, so I've shown you now the structure of a normal phospholipid. I want to show you now the structure of a modified phospholipid that's in the phospholipid bilayer, which is the structure that phospholipase C beta is going to break down. In fact, all phospholipase C enzymes will break down, but the one that's specifically been activated is a phospholipase C of the beta type. Okay, so here's the phospholipid bilayer again, and we are basically just going to look at a modified phospholipid. So let me tell you the name of it first, and then we'll try and understand uh, its structure. Right, so where should I write its name? I'll write it here. So its name is phosphatidyl, and now, now you will see why I told you that a phospholipid was called phosphatidate, because this is very hopeful. Phosphatidyl inositol, okay, we'll have to work on that. Uh, then it's 4,5-bisphosphate. Right, okay, and phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate is often instead denoted P for phosphatidyl, I for inositol, P for phosphate, and then you've got two phosphate groups, so PIP2, or PIP2. Right, so let's try and work out what this structure is. Well, let's start with our phosphatidyl thing up here. That basically means that you've got a phosphatidate molecule. Okay, so let's draw a phosphatidate molecule. We know what one of these is now. It's just a phospholipid. So here's our phospholipid drawn again. So uh, let's put on our glycerol in green here. Okay, our long chain carboxylic acids in orange is styrified to the first and second hydroxyl groups of the glycerol molecule. And here's our phosphate group in pink here. Now, we need to stick this phosphatidyl group onto an inositol molecule. So what is inositol? We now need to discuss what inositol is. Inositol is a six-membered carbon ring, okay? And you stick it off from this phosphate group of the phosphatidite uh, molecule. So here is our six-membered ring, which I'll draw as a hexagon here. And basically, it's a six-membered carbon ring. So if I just draw its skeletal structure here, here's this six-membered carbon ring. And all of the bonds of this six-membered carbon ring are single. Then all of the carbons of the six-membered carbon ring also have hydroxyl groups or alcohol groups coming off them. Okay? And then finally, to make up the bond number to four on each carbon of this ring, you also have a hydrogen coming off. So there is beautiful rotational symmetry of this, mole of this molecule, and you don't obviously draw the hydrogen coming off for a skeletal structure. So this is the skeletal structure of the inositol ring. Okay, so what you do basically is you take this inositol ring and you form a phosphate ester bond between one of the hydroxyl groups of this ring and uh, the remaining free hydroxyl group of this phosphate group that's attached to the glycerol molecule here, okay, in, within the phosphatidate molecule. And when you do that, the structure that you now get is phosphatidyl inositol. So this is phosphatidyl inositol. Now, what are we um, going to do now to phosphatidyl inositol? We need to turn it into PIP2. We don't just want phosphatidyl inositol, we want phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. And basically what that involves doing is adding more phosphate groups onto this inositol ring. Okay, so how do you label up the carbons now in this inositol ring? Well, 
obviously you're going to label the one that's bonded to the phosphate group as the first carbon. It's the only one that, um, that has anything important attached to it. So that's the first one. Then you call this one the second one, third, and you continue on. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we want phosphate groups coming off the fourth one, which is this one here, and the fifth one, which is this one here. Okay, so now we have created phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate, or PIP2. Right, now if you stare at that molecule for long enough, you'll decide that it shouldn't be called phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. You'll instead decide, as I have long ago, that it should be called phosphatidylinositol 3,4-bisphosphate. Why on earth someone long ago decided that the carbon with this phosphate group here um, coming off it should be labelled the fifth carbon of this uh, ring is against all modern day naming rules basically. In all modern day naming rules this should be uh, phosphatidylinositol 3,4-bisphosphate uh, i.e. you should label the carbons to minimize the numbers is generally the naming rules but if anyone knows the reason I'm sure there will be a good reason I think it'll be because of uh, other molecules in signaling pathways with this other related molecules that needed to be called something different well that need that were named sensibly and then this one was named so that it made sense in the context of the signaling pathway rather than so that it made sense in the context of chemistry naming, if that makes sense. Uh, but if anyone does know the reason that it's called phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate rather than 3,4-bisphosphate, please make a comment. I would be delighted to hear it. Okay, right. So, this is PIP2. So, this, I hope you can see, is pretty much just a... And I'm sorry about what the light just did then. I don't know why it's doing that tonight. Uh, so, this, as I hope you can see, is pretty much just a modified phospholipid. It's just a phosphatidate molecule with a bigger head. It's got this inositol and these two phosphate groups stuck off it. Uh, but as essentially, it's just a normal phospholipid with a bigger head. So, this is a normal component of the phospholipid by there within cells. So, it's within the phospholipid by there of the cardiomyocytes, uh, basically. And here is this enzyme that we have now activated, this phospholipase C of the beta type. So here is phospholipase C beta. Right, so now what is phospholipase C beta going to do with this poor PIP2 molecule? Well, when the alpha Q GTP complex, which I'll just draw here, comes and binds to the phospholipase C beta and activates it, phospholipase C beta is going to break down the PIP2 molecules. Okay, so what it's going to do, if I get a colour, what colour should I use for this? Use turquoise. Is it's going to cleave this bond here between the phosphate group here and the glycerol molecule. Okay, now what's that going to create when we split that bond there? Well, it's going to create two molecules. The first one is that it's going to create this molecule here, a glycerol molecule which I'll draw in green, sticking to convention, with two long-chain carboxylic acids esterified off the first and second hydroxyl groups of this glycerol molecule. Now, this sort of a molecule has a name. It's known as a diacyl glyceride, okay? Because you have two acyl groups uh, esterified onto a glycerol molecule. So let me just explain what an acyl group is, just in case you're not familiar with that term. Okay, so let's say we have a carboxylic acid here. So this is the sort of structure that we are esterifying onto our glycerol molecule. Now, when we esterify it onto the um, hydroxyl group of the glycerol molecule, what's going to happen is we are going to cut this hydroxyl group off the carboxylic acid group. Okay, so let's say we have our alcohol group, which we're esterifying the um, carboxylic acid to here. What you do when you form an ester link between a carboxylic acid group and an alcohol group is you cut off this hydroxyl group here off the carboxylic acid group. Okay, you also 
cut off this hydrogen off the hydroxyl group of um, the alcohol, okay? Then you bind the carbon here of the hydroxyl group to the high oxygen that remains of this alcohol group here, okay? And you bind the hydrogen to the hydroxyl group to make water. So the only bit of the carboxylic acid that you actually use in the ester is this portion. You don't use that hydroxyl group that was on the carboxylic acid group. Now this structure here is what's known as an acyl group. Okay, so that's why it's called a diacylglyceride because actually all that, that you're contributing when you put these free fatty acids in is the acyl group rather than the full carboxylic acid. Okay, so it's a diacylglyceride. Okay, so that's one of the products of this um, cleavage. And then the other product is the inositol ring. So here's the inositol ring, like so, with these three phosphate groups attached to it. One, two, three. Okay, so let's colour those in. So the inositol ring is in blue here. Okay. And uh, the phosphate groups are in pink. So, what should this molecule be called? Well, it's inositol with three phosphate groups bound to it. So, it's inositol here. And then we stick to the naming convention that we had in this ring. So, this is named number one. Okay, one. This is named two, three, four, five. So, it's inositol one, four, five, trisphosphate. And again, if you were sticking to modern... Um, convention with how to name molecules, that would have been inositol 134 bisphosphate, but it's inositol 145 trisphosphate. And for short, uh, people often abbreviate this to I for inositol, P for phosphate, and then free for free phosphates. Similarly, people often abbreviate diacylglyceride to DAG. Okay, so these are the two products of the phospholipase C beta enzyme. So, today, uh, for this pathway, we aren't actually interested in the IP3. So, goodbye to IP3. We don't care about you. We care about the diacylglyceride in this reaction. Because actually, when you do experiments to see whether the IP3 has any importance in cardiac muscle cells, uh, because we know how important it is in the contraction of smooth muscle cells. We know it should be able to release calcium from the ER, but we just don't find that IP3 increases the contraction of the heart at all. Uh, we just don't have any evidence for that yet. So this doesn't seem to be that important in the cardiac muscle cells at all. Instead, the important product of this reaction seems to be diacylglyceride. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.